speak on a Father's Day. When uh, Pastor Josh, your pastor, asked me, I didn't realize it was Father's Day. And then uh, as time went on, I realized and I had, to, I had to check with him again and say, are you sure you want me to speak on Father's Day? And uh, he had already put it in stone and I, uh, I had no way of backing out. So uh, it, was, it is what it is. But uh, I feel honored to be here on a Father's Day. And uh, um, I've been thinking of that. I woke up this morning and uh, I was just thinking about the role of a father. You know, none of us, and I, and I guess uh, you women would look at it in a slightly different way, but you go through nine months of carrying the child, whereas us men don't have anything until he suddenly appears. And uh, I, I know when my wife was pregnant with our first child, uh, I would have to say I was a bit detached. I saw her growing, but, but uh, I never... I didn't have much, it didn't have any more impact on me. You know, it's not until I held the child in my arms and I went, whoa, life has suddenly become serious. A year earlier we had married, or a little over a year, and I'd gone from being a single man for a long period of life. I was in my late 30s, and it wasn't until, uh, so I got married, and then, and then she got pregnant, and then the baby came, and, and life carried on until the point that I suddenly was in the hospital and holding this three-hour-old baby, and I went, wow, life, life is suddenly serious. And I think that is the way with many men or some derivative of that. Life is, life is good, life is single, we go through things, and then suddenly I become a father, and I go, now, now what do I do? How do I handle whatever I have to do? I've got commitments in, in work, I've got commitments here, I've got this going on, I've got that going on. And I've joined various clubs and suddenly I've got a baby to look after. And, and life gets complicated very fast. Uh, believe me, it really does. And it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a toss-up where you spend some of your time. And, uh, and so it's not easy being a father. And, and uh, now as a grandfather and with my son still not with us but still around, I... I have sons that are adults and who are still coming to dad, and I have grandchildren. So the, so the, the, the complication just gets more complicated. And, and, uh, and yet, yet it, it's, an, it's a joy, but it's a complicated. You know? and, and so uh, the whole role of a father, I remember one of the early days as a father, I think I encourage you to have children, those of you who haven't yet. There's such... There's such, a, there's such a lesson through having children. Amen. It's an incredible opportunity to learn and to experience the Father's love to His children. On one hand, you're a, on a horizontal plane, I'm loving my wife and my child. But on a, on a vertical plane, I'm a son to the Heavenly Father. Amen. So when I, when I, I remember this, in the early days... When I would get upset with my son, for whatever reason, I would remember that the Lord would remind me that I was his son and he would be upset with me over something. So there was always a vertical line and a horizontal line. And so we work as sons, we work as fathers in the community, in the, in the world, but I'm a son to my heavenly father. And so as I, as I want my son to do what I want him to do, to do, to, to, to be moulded the way I want him to mold, be moulded. My father is trying to mould me the way he wants me to be moulded. And that applies to all of us, men and women. Our Heavenly Father is trying to mould us, but we resist it. We do, we consistently resist what he says to do. And he says, he says in his word, if you love me, you'll obey me. And I find that such a simple statement. If you love me, you'll obey me. And I could say to my son, son, if you love me, then do what I tell you to do. And he would look at me with big brown eyes and say, I do, Dad, but I'm going to go play my own game. <laughs> and that's, that's kids, but that's also our reaction to our Heavenly Father. Daddy, I love you. Heavenly Father, I love you. I need a new this, I need a new that, but I'm going to go do it my own way. And, and we, we get the same things with temptation. I, I work amongst men with... with, uh, in, with, with uh, um, uh, what do I say? Coming out of coming in recovery, I'm working with men in recovery, and and they they often are doing well to a point, and then something will happen in their life, and they'll and they'll come up with all sorts of fancy reasons, 
And I say, mate, it's just your lack of self-control. And that's for the same for all of us. It's our lack of self-control, whether, whether I go and, and get a bottle to, to subdue it, whether I go back to smoking, whether I go back to swearing, or some other way, it's a choice I make. And it's the same thing my Heavenly Father is saying, Son, be careful with your choices. Be careful with your choices, all of us. All of us, and, and, and us as adults who, are, who, are, who have younger children, or those who are influenced, we are are influenced by our lives. We need to be careful what choices we make because they are learning from our choices, not so much from our words, but they're watching what we do. They're responding to our choices and our ways we, re we live life, more so than anything else. So, so it, it's, it's, it, as a father, it's an honour, but it's a great responsibility. It really is. I was talking to some of you, you men in, 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 uh, in the house here before the service, and it just reminded me how, what an honour it is to be a father, but how, what a responsibility comes with it. Both as a, as a father to a small child, as a father to a teenage, to an adult child, and to a, as a father to grandchildren, and to the derivatives of the wider family as, 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 as you have grandkids. It's a never-ending uh, responsibility. And so uh, I honour you fathers, really. <laughs> I'm there myself and it's not an easy task. There's a lot of juggling of time and space and thoughts and, uh, and things like that, but I, I honour you. And I want to, uh, I just want to, uh, I want to now move on to the word because I was, in thinking of this, Jesus said in John's Gospel, I don't do anything without the Father. I don't do anything without the Father's telling me. In John, John uh, 5, verse 19, he says, Truly, truly, the Son can do nothing without the Father. This is Jesus saying, I can't do anything without the Father. He goes on to our God, John's Gospel and says, I, Everything I do, I hear from the Father. Everything I see, I see the Father do. The Father, I, Father judges. I don't do anything. I just do what the Father tells me to do. It's amazing that Jesus... The Son of God had such a connection with His Heavenly Father. And, and as I think about that, how did He have that connection? How did Jesus have such, a, such a, a strong connection? He was busy. He had ministry to go, go to. He had work to go to. He had his normal. He felt tired. He felt hungry. He had all those human, human uh, uh, um, urges. But he relied on his father. He said, he, we, we often read where he went out to pray. He went out to communicate to his father. He went out in, in the quiet of the morning and knelt down and prayed. He was forever in communion with his father. There's a lesson there for all of us. How, how much are we in communication with our father? Heavenly father. Those of you who, whose fathers are around, how much are you in touch with your earthly father? But it's our Heavenly Father we talk about now. Our Heavenly Father. To what degree are you in touch with Him? You know, I've, I've found that with the men I work with, you can, uh, we have devotions every morning. The idea is that they have a devotion themselves. I am forever reminding them to have a devotion themselves. Most of them don't do it. Most of them will have some philosophical, fly-by-the-night sort of excuse not to have a devotion themselves. It's almost, it's almost laughable if it wasn't so serious. If you wanted to have a relationship with somebody, seriously, what would you do to them? You would sit and talk to them. I know nowadays you see two couples going to a restaurant and they'll sit there and they'll be on their phone and both of them are in a different world. That's the sort of world we're in. But that's not the way it's supposed to be. When we were young, we had an, we had, when we were in a family, we had a, a, a rule that all phones had to be off the table. No one could answer their phone while we were having dinner. Because it's the communication. Listen, you need to be communicating with your Heavenly Father. Jesus did. How much more do we need to do it? If you're not communicating, if you're not listening to Him, how are you going to know what to do? How are you going to know what to do? 
There's a friend of ours who's gone back to the old way of life. It's because he didn't have a communication with his heavenly father. He would come to church, he would do things, but he himself wasn't being built up. I hear the men, the men in, the, in the program will say, I listen to it on audio. I plug it in when I drive my car to work and I'm listening to Pastor so-and-so in the States preaching and he's preaching fire and brimstone and it's so great. I said, but that's not a devotion. That's not a devotion, that's a teaching session. <laughs> devotion is when you meditate on the Word of God yourself. Let, your, let God's Word dwell in my heart. Life will never go the way it, God intends it when we're just skipping through that devotional time of the morning. If you've got to get up at 5 o'clock, then get up at 6 o'clock. If you've got to get up at 6 o'clock, get up early at 5 o'clock and spend time with the Lord. That's the only way you're going to get through the day or you're going to fall by the wayside. I'm not saying that over your life, but that's the way it is. Unless you have a, a devotional time with the Lord. In other words, unless you're, you've got time with Him where He can speak to your life and you're speaking to Him. Not as you go through the shopping mall. Not as you, as you buy wheat bix at, at Coles. Not as you go through, through the traffic. But your time, your personal time with the Lord. It's the most important time of the day. And that's what will, will, what will get you through the storms of life. Yeah. The wise man built his life, built his house upon the rock. Mm. The wise man built his house on the rock. Which rock are you building your life on? Mm. It says in that story that Jesus told in Matthew that the storms came, the storms of life come to all of us. Sickness, financial relationships is always a big one. He said, I said, they thought, I thought. And the building fell down. One man's building fell down. In other words, the illustration is one man's life fell apart. There's a lot of people with lives that have fallen apart. A lot of people who are brought up in church whose lives have fallen apart because they walked away from the one, one foundation. Seriously, that's what we need to be doing. I want to turn to, to John 14. I want to turn to John 14 because John 14 starts with don't let your hearts be troubled. Jesus said to his disciples don't let your hearts be troubled. And this is after Jesus, the first chapter, the few chapters before Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. He had washed the disciples' feet. He had, uh, he had had the Palm Sunday uh, celebration, triumphant celebration. He predicted his resurrection. He was getting close to the end. All of these things had gone on just recently, before, the, before this chapter. And now Jesus says to them, listen, don't be troubled. Don't let the things of this world trouble you. How easy we are to get troubled by, the, by, by what's going on in the world. Be it the war in the Ukraine, be it China, be it the, be it the finances, be it the interest rate, be it this, that or the other. How easy it is. And Jesus says here, almost, almost you could see a joke in that. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me, he says. It's not enough just to believe in him. It's to be in touch with him. We need to be in touch with him. We need to be communicating with him. We need to allow him to speak to us. Believe in me, in him. He goes on to say, I'm going away from here. I'm going away to prepare a place for you guys. And he says, if I go away, I will prepare a place for you. Believe me that I will come again. There's a promise there that he's preparing a place for us all. And he's preparing it and he will come back again. And he says, I'm going away. You know the way that you should go and I like that. I like that because in verse, in verse uh, 4, can you put that up there, uh, Anungi? John 14, verse 4. You know the way to the place where I'm going. You know the way. In other words, through the three years or two and a half years of ministry, through the, through the time of his ministry, Jesus had been telling them, I'm going away. I'm not going to be here forever. Start building now. Start getting ready for what's going to happen. And Jesus is saying that to us now. 
Get ready for what's coming. Get ready for what's going to come. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And then he goes on to say, and, and, and Thomas says, Lord, can you go to the next verse? Thomas says to him, Lord, we do not know where you, you are going. How can we know the way? I find that a stunning statement. We do not know where you are going. How can we know? In other words, I don't know where I'm going. Basically what he's saying is I have no clue where I'm going. I've been with you, teacher, for the last two and a half years. But I haven't learned anything from you except I've seen some wow miracles. And I've had some wow rides on boats and various things like that. I've heard meals provided just out of nothing. But I, don't, I haven't learned anything from it. I think that's like many of us. We look at the miracles, we go, wow, we go, wow. People are healed, people are touched. But how much are we really taking into our heart? Thomas here says, Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? How can we know the way? Jesus has gone before them and said, I'm showing you everything. Follow me. Jesus goes on in the next verse and says, I am the way. I am the way, the truth and the life. In other words, he's saying, just follow me. Follow me, be in touch with me. Listen to what I'm saying to you. Listen to my voice. Follow me. Just as I follow the Father, you follow me. Just as you men want your son to follow you, God is saying to you, you follow me. Yeah, it works both ways. If you want your son to follow you, then you need to follow your father. All of us. Regardless of gender, we, it all works the same way. We often like to disconnect somewhere along the line and think, actually, I know a shortcut here. I know a better way around this. I'm just going to try and circumvent a little bit here. I don't like the pruning. I don't like, the, I don't like what I'm going through. I'm just going to try and find an easier way through this. And God says, no, that won't work. Yeah. No shortcuts are going to work. It just comes back to be a long cut a little further along. <laughs> he, Jesus says, I am the way. He makes it very clear. I'm the way. The truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know, Muslims will say, I'm, I go to the Father. Muslims will just try and go to the Father directly. But when you say to them, no, you've got to go to the Son to get to the Father... The conversation dies there. And many people will say the same. Many people will have that same sort of ob objective. But Jesus says here, now the way to the Father is through me. Many times he says that. He says the same sort of thing. He says, it's the Son, it's the Father that enables you to come to me. No one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus says. Pray. That God will enable your loved ones, your family. Pray that God the Father will soften them and will enable them to reach Him. In this time, in this end of, end, end of the ages here, we need to pray for those who are unsaved. Pray that God will enable them to hear His voice. Pray for softening of their hearts. Many out there with hardened hearts. Hurt hearts, but they have been hardened. Hardened in this world. And He says, if you know me, you'll know my Father. If you know Jesus, you'll know his Father. And I think that's very important for us. We focus on one, but we need to focus on the Father. Not just because it's Father's Day, but the Son leads to the Father. Jesus is refining us and calling us to him. It's the Father. Jesus said, if you really knew me, you would know my Father. Verse 7. If you had known me, you would know my Father also. And from now on, you would know him and have seen him. Why have they seen him? They've seen him in the Son. Jesus' life was, an, was identical to his Father. How many of us men, how many of us fathers can say that our sons are identical to us? We probably not, wouldn't really want that. But we would like it to think that they were learning from us. At least the good things about us. 
So Jesus is teaching them. Jesus is teaching here the connection between a father and a son. And we, as, our, as sons to the Heavenly Father, He's teaching us our vertical connection. That we need to be in touch with our Heavenly Father. Listening to what He's saying. Jesus went away on the hillside in the early hours of the morning. Got up early and went out to pray. In the Garden of Gethsemane, He's praying and He says, Father, if it's Your will that I have to go through with this, let it be done. But if it's not, is there not some way, is there not some way that we can get around going through this? But he said, okay, I'll go through with it. It's not my will, but your, your will. Yeah. Very hard thing to say. Yeah. But he says, I'll go through with it. That's, that's absolute obedience. That's incredible obedience when you know what the cost is. And Jesus knew what the cost was going to be. But we often look at that and say, well, yeah, I'm not ready for that cost. But the Holy Spirit enables us to go through with things. If we're trying to break addictions, we're trying to break lifestyle cycles, it's the Holy Spirit that enables us to break them. It's not in our own strength. It's not in my willpower. It's not in me psyching myself up and thinking I can do it. In dealing with the men... One, one guy struggles with alcohol. So I say, mate, why, why are you walking past a pub? Don't walk past the pub. Oh, well, you know, da-da-da-da-da, he says. And I says, well, you're, you're just playing with fire. And so many of us like to play with the fire of the things that, that, that tempt us. So many of us. One guy, one guy of course, like many, his, his problem is pornography. And so we've had to ban him from watching the computers and, at, at night and at, by himself because he can't be trusted doing things like that or in that environment. But it's, it's like all of us. We all have those little subtle little ways of getting around our weaknesses. We justify it in all sorts of fancy ways because we're not listening to the Father. Yeah. When we listen to the Father, we follow what the Father says. Mm -hmm. Jesus Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. He says, I am the good shepherd and my sheep hear my voice and follow me. And I think that's a wonderful example because his sheep, if you've ever been around sheep, and I'm certainly no sheep farmer, but sheep go everywhere. Sheep will go all over the place. But here he says, my sheep know my voice and they follow me. And you go, you know, I've seen on TV where, the, where farmers will have a, a, herd of, a flock of sheep, a small herd of sheep, and are able to call them and they follow him. And I'm amazed because that's not the way it's supposed to be with sheep. They're supposed to run all over the place. But obviously they follow, there is... I used to be on a farm, though. they follow each other. Yeah, they follow each other. Well, that's a bit like us. We follow each other in the wrong directions. We follow each other in the wrong direction. So anyway, we need to listen to his voice. It's his voice. And our voices in our head, we often hear many voices in our heads. From our past, from our lifestyle, from the way we've lived life, we have many voices in our head. But can we tell the one voice that we need to be listening to? Are we in the flock of sheep that we can hear his voice? We recognize our voice, his voice in our head? Or are we... Are we confused into which voice I'm listening to. That's what I have with the men in the houses. They, they, they'll say things and they're listening to the wrong voices in their head. The voices in your head will diminish as you stop listening to them. The voice you, you, you respond to is the voice that will go stronger. The voice that you stop listening to is the voice that will slowly grow weaker. But if we keep listening to the wrong voices in our head... We're just empowering the wrong voice in our head. So as we listen to God the Father, we're empowering the right voice in our head. Yes, that's what I'm going to do. Yes, that's what I'm going to do. Jesus said, my sheep choose to listen to my voice. And I think that's a great illustration. There's no confusion in his voice either. Yes. Well, once you, once you know what you listen to, then it is. But there is confusion 
when you try, when there's many voices in our head, yeah. there is confusion. Yeah. And the enemy, the enemy will come around and make him, make him sound the same. Mm. But we need to discern, and the Holy Spirit will enable us to discern, because the Holy Spirit is working for us, and He'll teach us what we need to listen to. In James chapter 1, can we turn to James chapter 1 verse 13 please, Anonge? In James chapter 1 it says, we are led astray because of our own evil intentions. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot tempt, be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. God doesn't tempt us. Yeah. Next one please. But each one is tempted when we are drawn away by his own desires and enticed by his own lack of control, self-control. So it's a self-control thing. It's not so much a temptation thing. A temptation, what's the difference between a temptation and a test? They're one and the same thing. If you are tempted in one way or another, you either pass the test or you fail the test. And it becomes a temptation. If you can stand up to it and say, no, I'm not going that way. No, I'm not going to do that. Then it's a test and you pass the test. But otherwise it's a temptation and you failed it. Every time you see a temptation. Actually it's the same Greek word. The temptation and a test is the same Greek word. It's just a different context they're used. Jesus went into the wilderness. And Jesus it says was tempted by the devil. Because the devil wanted him to fail. So the intention of the tempter was for him to fail. But because Jesus passed the test. It became a test and he passed it. He wasn't tempted. He was tempted, but he passed it and he passed the test. If you look at other cases, you look at other ones, David and Bathsheba, David went out that night and was on the rooftop. Nothing wrong with being on the rooftop. He looked down and saw this woman having a bath. He turned a test into a temptation and he succumbed to the temptation. If he had turned away and said, let her go, let her have her own bath. I've got... All I need here, if he would have passed the test. But he failed his test. And the next few chapters of the story explain the breakdown in his whole family life. So a test and a temptation is one and the same thing. It just depends on how we respond to it. A student at school will sit a test it's so that he knows what he knows. He can, or the teacher can find out how much he knows. But he can pass the test or he can fail the test. Same way as Jesus did in the desert. Same way as David did in the, on, the, on the rooftop. Same, same way as we see many times in the gospel. In the, in the word of God. The test and the temptation are one and the same. It just depends on how we respond to it. I can turn a temptation into a test and over, be, be victorious. Or I can turn a temptation into a temptation and I failed it. And I went back to my old ways and I failed it, and I'm now depressed, and I'm sad, and I'm ashamed of myself because I've given in. But they're, but they're one and the same thing. Jesus doesn't test, tempt us to make us fail. Jesus tests us so that we know where we stand, and so where he knows where we stand. The enemy tests us, tempts us to bring us down. So I'm not being tempted. I'm being tested to make myself stronger. So he says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away. By what? By his own evil desires. Because he hasn't been listening to the one true voice. He's allowed a, tempt, a test to become a temptation and has failed it. But each one is tempted when, when they individually are drawn away by their own evil desires. No one else has control over that. But each one is tempted. All of us are being tempted all the time. In various ways. Do we turn the temptation into a test and pass the test? Or am I going to succumb to it and be it a failure? And have to start, sit that test again in some later date. Okay, next verse please. Each one is tempted when they are drawn away. And when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full blown, gives birth to death. So it starts with us thinking about it. I see a chocolate bar in the shop. I want to take the chocolate bar. You see it with kids. They'll look around them and then they'll pinch it. 
They've thought about it. They know the consequences. But they've thought about how yummy it's going to taste. That overwhelms them. They'll run behind, they'll run behind the wall. They'll eat it. They'll throw it away. Then they'll, they'll come out with nothing, with an innocent look on their face. They've just got chocolate down their lips. They say, yeah, yeah, I know you're innocent. Go get me the, the chocolate wrapper that you just threw away to prove your innocence. When desire has conceived, when we, when we plan in our head, or we have it as a, if all else fails, I'll go and do this. I'll just go back to the bottle. I'll just go and do this. Temptation. We allow it into our lives. Jesus is, God is trying to test us to grow stronger. But it depends on the voice we're listening to. The shepherd, the sheep hear his voice. Jesus heard the voice of his father. Even in the, even in the biggest test of all in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus heard the test of his, the voice of his father and said, or the lack of a voice, and went to the cross. Through it all, it's the voice we hear. What are we listening to? Are we listening to his voice or are we listening to the voices in our head? And I want us to, to Anongi has got a, a short clip there. I've got a clip I want you to shut, see. I want to, I've got a clip here I just want you to see. I want us to watch it and then, uh, and some of you may have seen it, but I think it's, it's very powerful in, in the voice that it shows us. And what voice are you listening to? What voice are you listening to as you go through life? What is in your head as you start out your drive to work? Are you spending time listening to the true voice? Are we learning to listen to the true voice? Like our Father, like Jesus said, I don't do anything without listening to the Father. Is that our intention? That I only want to listen to the Father's voice? Or I listen to the Father's voice, but also I, I allow other voices in my head? Jesus said, only the one voice do I listen to. So, even as a shepherd, it says, I only listen to his voice. Jesus, Jesus in the storm on, on, the, on the boat, the disciples discerned his voice. In the darkness, if, you, if you're in the darkness, you'll pick up each other's voices because you recognize the voice. Your children will recognize your voice. My, my sheep know my voice. And Jesus is, is working on it. Jesus is speaking to us. He speaks to us all the time. He speaks to us all the time so we know his voice. We're just getting this uh, little clip here. Just an intermission while we get this uh, clip going here. I was in Alaska doing a lawsuit. We're way out in the Aleutian Islands, getting ready to leave and go back to Anchorage and then home. And I had a ticket in my pocket to get on an airplane. And a pastor came up and he said, listen, I can save you money. I said, how's that? He said, I flew a small airplane up here and I fly a small airplane and I can take you in my little airplane and you can save your ticket. And this did not sound, I said, gee, thank you so very, very much. 
but I've got this ticket. We'll just make our way on home, me and this other lawyer with me. He said, no, 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 you got to do it. You got to do it. And against every better judgment I had, I said, okay. Well, we went out to the airport, took us by his little plane, and I looked at it. And I thought, well, one good thing, it's shiny. Then he walked around it. We got in. He's on the left front. I'm on the right front. The other lawyer's sitting right behind me. And he started it up. And it started up just fine. Well, we taxied out. I said, should we pray? He said, yeah, that's a good idea. We normally don't. I said, well, this time we're gonna. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I prayed five, eight minutes. I prayed a long time. We went and got on the runway. He starts down the runway. The plane lifted off ever so gently and we start climbing. And it's wonderful. Not a problem in the world. We started climbing and we flew probably three, four minutes. And something happened that will never leave my mind. The pilot turned to me and he said, we're going in the clouds and I can't fly in clouds. They make me pass out. I said, clouds make you do what? <laughs> now it's been cloudy all day. And we go right up into the clouds and you can't see anything. And he looks at me and his eyes roll back in his head. And he starts mumbling and he passes out passed out cold. Now I grabbed him and I shook him and I said, come on, you got to wake up so I can kill you. Now we're in the clouds flying along with no pilot. And my friend in the back seat said, we're dead, aren't we? I said, there's a very good chance of that. Yes. He said, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know. But there was a radio right there and I handed him the microphone and I said, start asking for help. So he's in the back seat reaching up and he said, hello, hello. We didn't know any proper radio etiquette. All we were saying was hello. And somebody answered back, hello, hello, don't you guys know proper radio etiquette? And I said, give it to me. I said, tell we don't know nothing. Tell him we're in an airplane with a passed out pilot and we don't know how to fly this plane. The guy said, I'm a freighter flying out of Anchorage on the way to Tokyo. And he said, you're telling me you have nobody who can fly that plane with you? I said, tell him that's correct. Now you gotta understand, I am sweating bullets. He said, the first thing I'm gonna do is start circling so I don't lose you because I'll fly out of range of your radio and you won't have me anymore. And he said, I'm going to get Anchorage Emergency for you. And Anchorage Emergency will be the people that can maybe help you try to save your life. After about five minutes, Anchorage came on, said, we understand you have a passed out pilot. And those of you do not know how to fly that plane. We said, that's right. They said, well, the first thing we got to do is find you. And I'll never forget what this man at Anchorage said. He said, my job is to get you home safe. He said, that's my job. But he said, here's the deal. If you want me to get you home safe, you gotta promise me you'll obey my voice. He said, you can't see me, but I can see you. And he said, if you're not gonna obey my voice, you're gonna die. When you can't see anything, you have no idea how disorientated you become. Finally, he said, okay, I found you. Now hear me clear. He said, you're four minutes from a mountain. He said, you're gonna crash in that mountain and die. Follow my voice. I never said, I have to follow your voice? Is that reasonable? You see, I understood without his voice, I had nothing. And do you understand? Without God's voice, you have nothing. Nothing. Finally, he got us turned. And he said, I'm freezing all the traffic in the area. He said, it's going to take me an hour and a half to get you to Anchorage. And there's a lot of weather between you and Anchorage. You're in for a rough ride. And he said, I want you to hear me. I don't want you to look at what's going on outside. I don't want you to pay attention to the storm, just my voice. He said, if you start watching the storm, you will die. But I'll take you through it. Now, because they cleared all the traffic, several pilots, those nighttime freighters, those 747s started talking to us. They said, we're praying for you, men. You're going to make it, but listen to the voice. That's the key. They said, trust the voice. Do you realize your head is full of voices and everybody in this world wants to talk to you and everybody wants to be the controlling voice. And God says, I want you to be a living sacrifice. I want you to put yourself on the altar and let my voice be your voice. Finally, we went through the worst of the weather, but there was still more. And then the voice came back and it said, now, 
I'm going to line you up. He said, I'm going to bring you in right down the runway. And at the foot of the runway are some lights, and they're in the form of a cross. He said, don't you forget this. The cross is the way home. Finally, he's bringing us down. We still can't see anything. And all he kept saying is, stay with me. My sheep, the Bible says, hear my voice and they follow me. Finally, just a couple hundred feet off the ground, we saw the cross. I landed the plane. In fact, I landed it seven times. <laughs> Finally, it all came to a stop. And the minute we stopped, the pilot woke up. The voice said, thanks for listening. I watch them crash and burn all the time because they won't follow my voice. They don't understand I'm the one who can see them even when they can't see me. But they get the voices in their head and they kill themselves. They self-destruct. Thanks for listening to the voice. Then they put us in a motel room at about four in the morning. The knock at my door. I open the door and a man was standing there. He said, hello, David. I said, you're the voice. You're the one who got me home. He said, I am. Do you understand one day you're going to stand before him and say, you were the voice. You're the voice that brought me home. If you're not on that altar as a living sacrifice, your head's full of voices. And then we wonder why kids crash and burn. We wonder why marriages are shattered. And the Lord's saying, I'm the one who has the voice. All I can remember is that voice saying, stay with me. Stay with me. Don't listen to what's going on in your head and don't watch the storm. Stay with me. And I'll take you through. Tonight you have a God who has promised to take you through. A living sacrifice, holy. I like that. That's a very vivid way of explaining it. There's a lot of things we can learn from that short clip. One of the things I just noticed was right at the beginning, he had the choice whether or not to go in the big, go in his, his, with his ticket on the commercial flight or to go and save money and go on the little guy's plane. I hadn't noticed that before, but he had a choice and he made the choice. But it also talks about the voices that we hear, the voices in our head. And there's one voice in your head that will get you through. The other voices will lead you away. In all of our voices, you know, we're, not, we're, not, we're no different to anybody else. But it's which voice you're listening to. And then it said, don't look at the storms in, out the window. And if you imagine yourself in a little plane, you can't see anything in front of you. It's just white out there. And uh, you've got, no, you got no understanding or no feeling of where you are. It's a scary situation. And that's often how life is. I'm, I'm out of control. I'm overwhelmed by things. It doesn't make sense. I can't feel the ground. But when we follow this voice... The voice brought us home. And the guy said, my job is to get you home. And that's the Holy Spirit. It's God the Father. His job is to get us home. If we'll listen to his voice, if we'll follow his voice, if we'll communicate with him, he will get us home through the storms. We'll avoid the mountains. We'll avoid those disasters if we'll listen to his voice. Yes, it may be still rough and bouncy up there, but we'll avoid his vo the, the rocks. Maybe you've picked up other things out of that, that clip, but it's very vivid to where we're going. Let us listen to the voice of, a, of the shepherd. Let us listen to his, the voice of our Heavenly Father in all situations. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you are our Heavenly Father. I thank you for the example we see that Jesus did everything, followed the voice of his Father. 
And I pray, God, that each of us here today will become more focused on the voice of our Heavenly Father. We will not look at the storms in life. We will not be distracted by the things going on around us. But we will be men and women who follow your voice to the end. I thank you, Lord God, that you will see us through. You will take us home safely. You will land us on the cross, the cross that is there for us already, and you will bring us home. We thank you for this. We thank you for that assurance that we have. We thank you for that to promise in you that all those who listen to your voice follow after you, receive eternal life. And I pray, God, that as we leave here today, that our ears be tuned to your voice in a greater way. We'll be men and women that follow your voice in all things. And I thank you, Lord God. I thank you that you speak to us in ways that we understand. You stir us in the dark at night, in the busyness of the day. You call us by name and you're always with us. Lord, we thank you and I pray a blessing upon everyone here today that you would bless us in our going out and coming in, in our rising up and sitting down. In all things, as we go home from here today, we go and celebrate Father's Day. We do things this afternoon that we would be tuned in to your voice at all times. And we thank you for it. Thank you that you are our rock and our salvation, taking us home. Bless each one here today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.